I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have been. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. The end of the reading. Our New Testament scripture will be taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 22 through 27. And it reads as follows. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we will wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we are. But that very Spirit intercedes and sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The end of the reading. Amen. As we prepare to go before the Lord, to seek his help in our time of need, to thank him for who he is and for what he's done, let us carry the names of Sister Lynette Phillips and Faye Holland. Sandra Hayes and Willie Jean Reed, Bessie Sumter and Vincent Howell, Valerie Griffin and the Nicholson and McGill families, for Betty and John Perry, for Leola Johnson and for Raffaella and Jeff Taylor, for Bobby Sherman, Martel Jones, Greta Gerald and Sarah Livingston. Let us pray. Eternal God, we are so thankful that we can come into your presence at a time like this. And you have a special way of treating each of us as if we were your only child. God, you know the number of hairs on our heads. You've counted every single tear that we've ever shed. And you have loved us intimately. And we thank you. Father, we ask that you would look on those who are sick, those who are shut in, and those who are grieving the loss of their loved ones. Father, we ask that you would visit each and every one of these people, name by name and one by one, and that you will fill their cups with what they need, that you would touch their lives, that you will heal their bodies, that you will save their souls. Lord God, that you will turn their mourning into dancing. Father, we ask that you would have your way in our lives and that you would forgive our sins and strengthen us where we are weak. Help us to be the people that you have called us to be. Father God, help us to be about building your kingdom, not just hearers of your word, God, but doers. Father, we ask that you would be with your manservant as he prepares to bring a word from you. Help us to be still in our bodies to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, Lord. And then help us to do those things that you would have us do for the glory and the honor of your name. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.
our sermonic selection, the next voice you will hear will be that of our pastor, the Reverend Dr. James Abrams Jr. as he comes to us with a sermon topic entitled, The Performance of a Promise. Father, 
the spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because they do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. The spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all the truth. But he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The end of the reading. <clears throat> Beloved, I want to preach to you this morning from the theme, the performance of a promise. The performance of a promise. Today is Pentecost Sunday. In Christian dawn, we celebrate the birthday of the church. Feel like singing happy birthday to the church this morning. Throughout this Easter season, we have been thinking and talking about radical love. Radical love is unmotivated by the possibility of reciprocal or reward. Radical love is unconditional love. Radical love is agape love. Radical love and new life through Jesus Christ is what we've been thinking about and talking about during this Easter season. For it was radical love that came down through 40 and two generations and the word became flesh that lived among us. And we, <clears throat> we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. Well, well before Jesus ever preached his very first sermon, there was John the Baptist. And long before Jesus ever uttered a parable or healed a blind person, there was John. But John had come to prepare the way for his cousin Jesus. And when John preached about this great and coming one, he talked a lot about the Holy Spirit. Everybody who came out to see John knew that chief among the spectacles they would witness would be baptism. After all, they had nicknamed John the Baptist for nothing. Baptizing was to John what making bread is to a baker. But John always downplayed his baptism in favor of the vastly more powerful baptism Jesus would bring. 
hopping up and down with great verb, John said that the real fireworks would start as soon as Jesus showed up to baptize people, not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. For all the publicity he had garnered, John's self-assessment of his own ministry boiled down to this. You ain't seen nothing yet. But then a funny thing happened in his ministry. Jesus hardly ever talked about the Holy Spirit, nor did he baptize anyone. It wasn't that John had anticipated at all. And so in a startling passage in Matthew 11 and Luke 7, John at one point sends Jesus a message to ask, are you the one who was to come? Or should we be on the lookout for somebody else? You know somebody better. But John was looking for more spirit, more fire. But in this Pentecost year B lection from John 16, we encounter what Dale Bruner calls Jesus' spirit sermon. And it is hands down the longest single section about the Holy Spirit in all the Gospels. As a matter of fact, in all the Bible. But here we discover that John the Baptist had been right, except for the timing of it all. Jesus was going to send forth a powerful Holy Spirit but the surprise comes from the fact that before he would do this, Jesus himself would go away. Call it a kind of Trinitarian tag team approach, if you will. The Father dispatched the Son to this world to teach, to suffer, to die, and to rise again. Then the Son returned to the Father so he could send the Holy Spirit to his followers on this earth. Jesus makes clear that the Holy Spirit would become the conduit through which would flow all the energy and riches of God. The Spirit would become the jumper cables, if you will, to reinfuse us with the Father's energy whenever the church's batteries ran down. The Spirit would become the cosmic water main through which the cleansing tide of baptism would flow to wash away all sin. The Spirit would become the ultimate radio beacon who would broadcast the truths of Jesus, letting all of us who have been fitted with the right antenna learn on a constant basis the implications of the gospel for our lives. For it is clear that the Holy Spirit is and has been the church's living connection to God ever since the great day of Pentecost. Ever since that blessed day we can all say we are connected to the source. But this tends to be the limit of our thinking about the role of the Holy Spirit for many of us. That is to say, we quietly respect, restrict the Spirit's primary work to the interior life of the church and its members. That's why John 16 is so arresting. Because here, when Jesus talked about the Spirit's work, he focused as much on the Spirit's work in the wider world as he did on the Spirit in the church. In fact, in verse 8, the very first thing Jesus says has to do with what the Spirit will reveal, not to the church, but to the Word. The Spirit, according to Jesus, will tell the world three related things. Three things again, three things, here we go, three things. Three things the Spirit would relate to the church. First, what's wrong? Secondly, was right. And thirdly, who won? And please notice, my brothers and my sisters, that any one of those teaching without the other two would be not just incomplete, it would be wrong. 
take away or forget about anyone, and the other two dissolve into confusion. First, the Spirit reveals what's wrong. The Spirit needs to convict the world of guilt with regard to sin, Jesus says. In other words, just talking about the fact that this world has problems is not enough. In fact, it has never been too difficult to convince the world that something is fundamentally amiss. The key is to underscore not just that something is awry with life, but why that is so. For surely there's something wrong with this world, all right, and the reason is S I N C. The Holy Spirit of Pentecost reminds us of this. But secondly, Jesus said the Spirit comes to convict the world of something else. Was right or righteous? Now at first glance, that seems like an odd thing to say. These verses are a bit difficult to translate or understand. But it seems that Jesus is saying that he himself is the righteous one. The source of all that is good and beautiful and proper. For the Spirit reveals this Christ to the world. But that's not to say that we never arrive at a conclusion of judgment. Because that is the third thing Jesus says the Spirit must do. Tell the world who won. The Holy Spirit of Pentecost is here also to reveal to the world that the prince of darkness is done for. It's over. It will be the goodness, it will be the grace, and the beauty of the righteous one that will rule the cosmic day in the end. And my brothers and my sisters, that's the good news of the Gospels. But don't wait till the battle is over. Can I get a witness? You can shout now. So as people of Pentecost, we need to let the Spirit use us to tell the world what's wrong. But we do this ever and only with hope in our voices. For there is much that is wrong. But because it is not random wrong, but a systemic problem that can be traced back to sin, it is possible for a powerful God to fix that systemic wrongness and in Christ Jesus, help me, Holy Ghost. The Lord God has already done so. It is a true saying, the Lord does all things well. He is full of grace and truth. Full of grace, complete with grace overflowing with grace, such as it is that he gives us grace upon grace. Uh, he's the true, and because he's the true, he himself he cannot deny, and because he's the true, he himself he cannot lie. And so he promised his disciples in his farewell discourse in John 14 and 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. And if that was not enough, again, he promised his disciples in John 16 and 4, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, Sorrow has filled your hearts. And nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away.
away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The glory to God, Dr. Luke records, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Their body tongue, there the fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Glory to God. Jesus kept his word. It was a promise made and a promise performed. It was a promise made and a promise kept. He gave the gift that birthed the church. He gave the gift that comes alongside of us and leads us and guides us into all truth, the paraclete. He gave the gift that intercedes for us and help us to pray for others. He gave the gift that shows us and teaches us how to love one another. He gave the gift that even shows and teaches us how to love even our enemy. I said he gave the gift that teaches us how to forgive and forget and love and live. He gave the gift that gives us light in darkness and strength in weakness. He gave the gift that gives us joy in the midst of sorrow. He gave the gift that will always be with us. I said he gave the gift that leads us from day to day. He gave the gift that keeps on giving. Praise God and hallelujah. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Break me, melt me, mold me. Feel me, spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Can you feel the breeze? Can you feel the wind? Can you feel the fire? There's a blessing in this house for you. There's a blessing in this house this morning for you. I said there is a blessing in this house this morning for you. And that blessing is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And please remember, all of God's gifts are tailor-made. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. But what God has for you is for you. Amen, amen, and amen. Happy birthday to the church. For today is Pentecost.
of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord God, for the performance of that promise. And we thank you, Lord God, by faith for the promise of the time that we shall all return to the sanctuary and lift holy hands and praise you and dance as we celebrate life, celebrate Christ, celebrate Pentecost, celebrate baptism, celebrate Advent, celebrate the resurrection, celebrate Easter, as we celebrate your grace, your mercy, and your loving kindness in this house. For they are blessed in this house for all of your children. And it starts with the gift of the Holy Spirit. We pray today that there has been a seventy word that has pricked the heart of some man, woman, boy, or girl. And they will make a decision this day to confess Jesus as their Christ and receive him as Lord. Continually keep us in your constant vigil, continually watch over us, continually protect us. In your name we pray. Amen. May God's grace and God's peace be with you all. May you continue to be well and stay safe and serve the Lord. Thank you for watching. You may continue to watch our worship services via our church's website or you can watch us on Facebook where we encourage you to leave comments regarding today's message, share the video with family members or friends, or even start your own watch party. I'd like to invite you to join us via Facebook Live on Wednesday, May the 26th at the hour of 7 p.m. for Bible study. Thank you to those that continue to give faithfully to this ministry despite these trying economic times. If you would like to give, please send your check or money order to the St. James Baptist Church or you can give online to our church's website using the Givelify. To learn how, please watch this short video. Givelify is giving simplified. Givelify is the simplest, most beautiful way to give and track donations to the place of worship or charity of your choice. You're not limited to the cash you have on hand. There's no need to write checks, and there are no complicated forms to fill out or text message codes to remember. Givelify automatically pinpoints your location and intelligently identifies the fundraiser, worship service, or conference you're attending without the need to search. Since Givelify automatically detects where you are, making a donation can be completed in as few as three taps. Tap 1. Use one of the pre-configured denominations to choose your donation amount. Tap 2. Select the campaign to which you'd like to contribute. Tap 3. With your stored credit or debit card, complete your donation in one tap and get an immediate donation receipt. Setting up recurring giving is a simple two-tap process. Tap the frequency you'd like and you'll never forget to make your gift. Givelify lets you easily see your complete donation history. Mark the place of worship you normally attend as your home for quick one-tap access. Givelify. Tap. Give. Done.